for the next presentation, I would like to invite our next speaker, Professor David Lieber, who is Professor of Surgery at the University Hospital of North Tees, where he has been involved in extensive research in the fields of wound healing, breast surgery, and patient warming. And he'll be talking about surgical site infection, where we are today. Again, question mark at the end, and all the presentations have the same. So, audience is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's interesting I left North Tees 10 years ago, but this society hasn't taken that in yet. Epidemiology of SSIs. Um, people tell you it's 25 to 5%. It isn't. It's a lot more. If they tell you it's that, they're not looking. It's a healthcare-associated infection, and they're all expensive. Nobody seems to take any notice of surgical site infection, but there we are. Um, let's see if I can persuade you. Um, Good accurate audit needs an infection control nurse on the job or somebody to really do this properly. If surveillance is good with a trained unbiased observer, you'll have at least three times the SSI rate you think you have. But who's going to pay for it? And don't forget that most SSIs present in primary care, and that's another problem. This is a little personal dig at my government. This is what we spend on infection in the UK. You see how much they spend on surgical site infection research? It's up the top there, 1%. Finn's covered this, uh, but I think, if I may, I'll reiterate what he said because the definitions are critical. These are real old-fashioned things from the 60s, drawn out of thin air, but they still sort of fit well today, I think. And again, Finn's shown you that here's some real patients look with those same things. The problems with this classification is it's only a kind of yes, no. Do you know what I mean? When you go into the CDC, you either do or you don't have a surgical site infection. So let's look at that. Um, a bead of pus or a total disaster are an SSI, but the two are very, very, very different in severity. And I'm sure you'd agree with that. It's interesting also that the Americans, when they use the CDC definition, on the bottom of that list, they say, if the attending surgeon says so, and we've dumped that because surgeons never admit to having SSIs. So here's a sepsis. This is now using interval data. Uh, it's a research tool, although you could use it in, in practice. But you get five or ten points for each of these items. So you can have a, a, a spread of severity of the scores. And I think it's much more useful to have that. So it gives you an idea whether you've got a severe infection like these or just a bead of pus. Uh, I, I, I call myself fortunate to have chaired this nice guideline on surgical site infection from, what, from which we've had several guidelines come out of uh, in the UK and worldwide for that matter. The point is this is level one evidence. Finn's mentioned hair removal. You don't need to do it. The neurosurgeons don't do it anymore, so why should anyone else? But if you really must do it, do it close to the surgery using a clipper, not a razor. We all agree with that. Antibiotic prophylaxis. This is also very old research, you know, this was all done in the 70s and 80s, and you wonder if you revisited this now, whether we'd find the same uh, things. But the, the NICE guideline, very firmly, on this old evidence is saying, if there's a prosthesis, if the wound is clean contaminated or contaminated, use a prophylactic antibiotic. And Finn alluded to this, this is a, a lovely old study, uh, and you've got to orchestrate when the antibiotic's given. If you give it too early or too late, you miss the boat and you'll have a higher SSI infection rate. So if you're going to use antibiotic prophylaxis, give it at induction. This is uh, some work I've been, still am involved with, looking at warming patients and keeping them warm during surgery. This is actually local warming study compared with systemic warming, uh, mostly day case surgery. So we're talking about hernia, varicose veins, breast surgery. And you can see that standard surgery, when you look hard, up to 15%, but when you've locally or systemically warmed the patient, highly significant reductions to 3.66%. And serendipitously, when we followed the patients up, we found that in general practice, if the patients weren't complaining with their wounds, they always got an antibiotic without being looked at. People don't look at wounds in primary care. But look at the ones who were not warmed. 16% were having antibiotics for their wounds, which is probably inappropriate, and only 65 in the warm group. And then we wonder, Finn, why we get res resistance. We're just using uh, them like smarties, not good. 
This is another study looking at systemic warming now using conductive resistive polymers. Very easy, cheap way of keeping people warm during surgery. And there's really good evidence from many, many studies now that I've been involved in and lots of others. Uh, we're just doing another Cochrane review like this one is, but there is level one evidence that avoiding hypothermia in surgery reduces SSIs, the need for blood, and the uh, cardiac dysrhythmias, and uh, overall stays. Now, in the guideline for, from NICE, we looked at all sorts of things, and on, on the right there, the research opportunities were identified, and I've marked in red how often they say antiseptic. And I think we really do have to think of going back to antiseptic use more so we can avoid the antibiotics. And here's Lord Lister doing a ward round. He was a phenol man. Of course, we know that's far too toxic. But now, in, on the bottom uh, left here, we have these outstanding antiseptics to, to use, uh, and they really do need to be used. Here's a study which has changed skin prep in the United Kingdom. It's not a bad study, but it's got a lot of flaws, the main one being that they compared alcoholic chlorhex with aqueous povidonidine, but they showed a halving of the SSI rate in clean and clean contaminated surgery. Impressive. Uh, it would be nice to see some further studies support that, uh, but this is almost normal practice in the United Kingdom now. And in the same issue of the Journal of Medicine which presented that, uh, it was a thing about not just uh, looking at Staphylococcus MRSA, but also metatillin sensitive assays. Is it worthwhile screening everybody and decolonizing them? This was a poor study, and I'm surprised New England Journal uh, published it, because it's, there's not much randomization in there. And we looked hard at the Department of Health in England. Should we be doing universal screening for staffs to prevent SSIs? And based on this, the feeling was no. It would be too expensive. Looking after glucose, very important. It's part of the metabolic response to trauma to be hyperglycemic. Um, and after cardiac surgery, it's been shown by lots of people that High blood sugars, even in non-diabetics, cause this dreadful complication of sternal dehiscence. Has a high mortality, and if you save the patient's life, they're in ICU for months, and very expensive. And this is Tony Funery's data showing that if you can get the blood glucose down in the perioperative period, the risk of that is really minimized in non-diabetics as well as diabetics. In the NICE guideline, we talked about care bundles. And on the bottom right, there is a care bundle for our Department of Health. It's exactly the things Finn and I have been talking about. Prophylactic antibiotics, shaving, warming, and managing glucose. They're not expensive to put in. This is some work I've just finished with people in Leicester. Um, and smoking advice is free. And it doesn't cost much to even look at things like patient warming. So £25 a patient, would it be worthwhile doing that? Well... That's easy stuff. You've all seen this stuff. Now, we, we showed in Leicester, or they showed in Leicester, that in fact the cost of a surgical site infection in colorectal surgery was about 7,000, 8,000 pounds. So if you introduce this um, care bundle and just saved one SSI, it would be cost effective. And the same is true for breast surgery too. If that care bundle can save one infection, it's cost effective. Methods of surveillance I could spend all day talking about. If you don't look for it, you don't find it. And uh, I think surveillance for SSI is very poor in the United Kingdom. I'm not sure about other countries. But we have now a mandatory uh, thing in the United Kingdom that your SSIs have to be reported in orthopaedic surgery. Well, if you're not looking very hard, your SSI rate's low. So I'm concerned about using this as a benchmark. The reflection sign, you ask yourself, well, you look in the wound, you can see your face. It's a disaster. Shouldn't happen. Orthopedic surgeons, therefore, one of my orthopedic chums has a chlorhexidine shower himself three times a week. He's so obsessed with his SSIs. And these are the things he's introduced over a two or three week year period. And his SSI rate now is one of the lowest in the world. But discharge as well, is just, discharge surveillance is equally good. I can't tell you enough times, if you don't have an unbiased trained observer, don't trust the figures of the study. I hope somebody's not presenting something after me that hasn't. So tactics to improve compliance. Um, it's the same over in the US. They have the SKIP as well, um, Surgical uh, Improvement Program. 
And SSI rates aren't falling. It's got to be down to poor compliance. Finn showed you that slide, and I just want to introduce biofilm yet again. Biofilms are important. I'm not going to go droning on about them because I know there's been so much mentioned, but they do occur in acute wounds too. And I think, you know, in chronic wounds and even in cancers, biofilms are very important, and a lot of people have spoken about in this, at this meeting, and I, I wouldn't want to dwell on that. But here's an acute wound, a breast wound where a stitch has come out of 10 days, a subcuticular proline. Both wounds have fallen apart. There's no pus, there's no smell. Is that an acute biofilm that's preventing healing? Because it's not really classically infected. And I think there's a real big area for research there. And I would push you to think about antiseptics again. Remember, antiseptics hit every part of the bacterium. Uh, cytoplasm, cell wall, uh, nucleus. Antibiotics only work on one of those things. And for that reason, it's easy for them resistance to occur. There is no recorded incidence of resistance, acquired resistance to antiseptics in a human pathogen yet. I appreciate that there is a theoretical risk, but it hasn't happened yet. So what about using triclosan um, as an antiseptic? Um, it's pretty safe. It would be useful as a suture. And here it is as a bit of, this is one of the best bits of marketing I've ever seen. I was quite convinced by this alone. But then you have to do this nowadays. Here's Bradford Hill telling us uh, the randomized controlled trial is the gold standard. And yet, towards the end of his life, he said, any belief that that's the only way of showing difference means we've gone too far. And I think the Cochrane collaboration in particular looked far too hard for meta-analysis results. And they rather refused to look at this data which is at the bottom of the pyramid. It's all important when you're writing a guideline. And I think David Sackett has it right. He says, yeah, use the best available evidence, but use your common sense. Use your experience. If it's appropriate, ask the patient what they think. Involve them. Anyway, triclosan sutures has been involved with them. There's been a lot of meta-analyses in the last couple of years on them, two of which are mine. The first one was very early and didn't look at the better studies. And then here's three studies, all showing the same thing, with relative uh, reductions of about 30%, which is highly statistically significant. This is the one we did, Prisma diagram, 15 eligible trials, the funnel plot. If it, I don't think it's time to explain what funnel plots are if you don't know what they are. But if all the dots are underneath the arrows, that means there's a no, very likelihood of no public application bias. The sensitivity analysis of this latest study means you can take out any three studies from the 15 and still have statistical significance. That's a good sensitivity. It means the data are robust. And on the forest plot, Finn showed you one of these, anything to the left of one is statistically significant. Okay, so the relative risk reduction is about 30% by using triclosan uh, impregnated or coated sutures. And I think that evidence is out of sight. That's the details, really. Um, I can't understand, Chairman, why people aren't using triclosan sutures, but it's not catching on. But having said that, I'm sure Finn would agree, the days of chromic catgut and silk are long gone because they cause all sorts of problems. But surgeons don't change. Here's a classic surgeon. I suppose it could say it's a picture of me in my youth. Give me what I want, not what I ask for. And should plus sutures be in the care bundle? Yes. Thank you. Thank you.